Yeah, this morning I'd like to kind of continue on from what I was talking about last time. Um, last time I was talking about intimacy. And um, I guess this is a part two. And um, the kind of what I've titled this talk is um, Choose Sonship. Um, and so it's kind of what I'm getting at. And um, I just want to, before, I, before we launch into scripture and things like that, I just, this phrase that kind of came into my mind the other, the other night... Um, it's kind of where the platform I'm kind of walking from into this talk. And uh, that simply is this. It's, it's not for me to manufacture success or build my own platform. If I'm not complete without it, I'll never be complete with it. There's nothing to prove. I choose sonship. And what I mean by that is um, you know, something God's teaching me. I'm reading some books on at the moment. And, um, and actually it's really... It's, it's, it's been the journey of my life for the last few years, probably the last 10 years actually, is, is going from this place of, as, I, as I've talked about before, going from this place of kind of earning and trying to build um, uh, my own way into the sort of the things God has for me, the promises of God, into this place of actually receiving what God has for me. You know, it's, it's, it's not earned, it's given. Um, and so, and I'm reading about that moment and just this focus that God's given me is just look at your roots. Look at your roots. If you're looking at your roots, the fruit will come. You know, if you think of a tree, um, when a tree is planted in good soil and it has all the things it needs, it has the right amount of light, you know, it has the, it has the right soil, it has the right moisture, you know, the, the roots will do the work for that tree. Um, if the roots aren't able to go down into the right soil if there's if there's too much um, kind of rock in the way if there's too much kind of stuff that gets in the way of the roots you know the fruits can be very limited um, if if not at all and that a tree more than likely won't survive very long but you know a, a tree that's established in the right place in the right way can can go for years and years and years and years and years decades and decades you know some trees hundreds of years um, so yeah that's, that's what I'm kind of getting at. That, so to summarise really is I'm going to talk about when we are in a place of rootedness, we can expect fruitfulness in our life. And um, so I'm going to base this um, on, on Colossians 2, um, which I'm, I'm going to read through. Um, and then I'm going to pick out a few kind of things that stand out for me from the verses. And then I'm going to expand upon that. So here we go. So Colossians 2 says... I want you to know how hard I am contending for you. This is Paul preaching, uh, writing. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. Interesting, kind of the things he has been saying this morning about unity. So that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom we are hidden all the treasures of, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments, for though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see you disciplined to, sorry, and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. 
Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are the shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false uh, humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So if you've got your Bibles, keep that open because we're going to be going through that. So the things I really want to pick out to start with, so I'm going to go jump straight to verse 5 where it says, For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith is in Christ. And I just want just to pick up that, that, that thought, that, that kind of idea that our lives are disciplined and firm in Christ. Um, a lot of this passage goes on to talk about kind of the things where um, you know, we, we try to put on the disciplines of this world. We try to fulfill the practices of this world, the way this world says we should be. Um, or the, 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 sort of the rules of the age and all those sort of things, the elemental spiritual things. Um, but in reality, they don't cause a disciplined life. They don't leave us in a place where we're firm in who we are. Only in Christ do we have that discipline and that firmness of faith. So that's verse 5. And verse 6 and 7 goes on to, to talk about how um, we are rooted and built up in him. You know, it says that we are strengthened in the faith as we were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. And you know, thankfulness, I believe, is fruit in our life that we should be looking for. Um, you, know, you, you could look at our lives, you know, am I, am I looking at life kind of, am I grumpy? about my circumstance I am at times I'm going to be honest I'm sure we all are or do I choose to actually come into a place of looking above the situation and being thankful and um, you know that's one of the one of the, I think one of the fruits that we can have and this was one of the things that gets us to be more fruitful is being able to choose thankfulness and then we go on um, into verse 8 it says you know it warns us to not fall into traps the forces at work you know and um, I'm going to come onto this in a bit but I'm kind of I'm looking at kind of looking at this passage and I'm and I'm looking at life and I'm becoming aware that you know there's there's sort of there's two forces at work there's there's the there's there's heaven there's the reality of heaven the kingdom and then there's the kingdom of darkness there's realities of this world the, the powers and the principalities at work and um, we're being we're being warned here do not fall into these traps these forces that are at work and verse nine goes on to say that he is the head. Christ is the head over every power and authority. You know, he is the head over every power and authority, which we need to know. Verse 12, we are raised with him. And the emphasis is the with him. And uh, verse 13, God made you alive with Christ. So in Christ we are alive. We're alive with him. There's that oneness theme that God's been bringing to us over the last few weeks. Verse 19, they have, they have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. God causes the growth. God causes us to grow. And all, of, all, all the way through this, I'm talking about, I'm seeing Paul, Paul saying, be rooted, be connected in, be in Christ. Know that in him you, you grow. In him um, you are alive. With him you are alive. Um, Bill Johnson talks about um, this is a little phrase he uses God isn't interested in our comfort he's interested in our growth and that's really challenging at times because I think you know a lot of us you know 
a lot of our goals in life, probably in many ways, is, is comfort. It's a new new. We've got enough. We've got the things that we need. Um, you know, winter's coming in. We want to be warm. You know, our house, we move to a house. It's quite cold, isn't it? Amy, at times, and um, we're, we're looking to be warm. But and you know, God, God's actually more interested in that we grow, that we learn, that we that we are able to stand when hard times come. You know, it doesn't. There, there isn't sort of. I think we need to understand that there isn't this sort of promise that um, when we come to Christ, life's going to be really easy and all the problems are going to go away. Because, um, you know, actually he promises us that we'll, we'll, we'll face sufferings and we'll have to endure hardships for his name and for his glory. Um, some of the challenges, you know, even in our sufferings, we make his sufferings complete. And <laughs> really challenging things. God wants us to grow more than he wants us to have comfort. And then going on to verse 23 um, to 23, um, again, as I mentioned, these two kind of, well, uh, these two kind of kingdoms, but um, the, the kingdom of heaven is upside down, is, is how I'd summarize that. It doesn't work the way of the world. Um, the, I, I believe the, the world talks about how we need to, uh, if you think about kind of life and, and, and kind of a classic example is kind of work situation, the harder I work, the better I'll do. Um, the more, the more I achieve in, um, in, in qualifications and the rest, the more I'll earn. All those sorts of things. And the more I'll earn, the more influence I'll have. That's, that's often how things look, um, sadly. But God's kingdom isn't like that. It's, you know, you cannot earn anything in God's kingdom. Because it's all given. It's all, it's all freely given. Um, it's all grace. It's all, it's all a grace gift. And uh, so just... So bear in mind that the, the kingdom is upside down. It doesn't work the way of this world. It works complete in reverse. It's we are accepted, not we have to earn acceptance. Um, and we work from that place of being accepted rather than working towards that place of being accepted. And then um, on the end, uh, just something I thought was um, quite key, quite interesting in, 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 the last, uh, in the last verse. It says... Um, Right at the end it says, they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So it's the things, the wisdom, the, the self-imposed worship, the false humility, harsh treatment of the body, all of that. It says, but they lack all these things, but they lack any value in restraining, in restraining sensual indulgence. And I just thought that was really interesting um, that, you know, at, right at the start I was talking about verse 5, it's how Paul says, I delight to see how disciplined you are, um, that there's a firmness and a strength in, in who are in Christ and um, I think we can often read this passage and misunderstand what it's getting at I, I think at, at times we can look at this and go are we um, you know oh okay so you know all, that, all those do's and don'ts you know they, they don't apply you know I don't have to um, live according to a set of rules all that sort of stuff and, and it kind of in a way it is saying that you don't have to but the outcome of a life in Christ is more discipline than a life following the law. It's more discipline than a life following the do's and don'ts. So I would say if, if we look at our lives and uh, in Christ and actually, you know, we're not moving to a place where we're actually fulfilling the law. Because Christ came to not do away with the law but to complete the law, to fulfill the law. If we look at our lives and we don't actually see that we're measuring up to the law in, in a way that's fulfilling it, um, I'd ask are we in Christ. Um, because you know, there should be fruit in our life that um, that our lives would reflect this place where we're living in this place of holiness. We're living in this place of oneness with Jesus, where what comes out of our mouth is good. Um, you know, it's what what this is saying actually is 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 a flip. As I said, it's an upside down kingdom. It's it's saying you know that you know it's not what you put in that makes a difference. It's what comes out. And if we're in Christ, and if Christ is in us, and we're alive in Christ, what's going to come out? It's going to be obedience to who God is. It's going to be a life that looks a lot like the life Jesus lived. And, uh, you know, and, and I'd say that, that this, you know, discipline is a hallmark of a disciple. You know, the word disciple and the word discipline are very much connected. You know, a disciple, you know, someone who lives by, by God's rule. Someone who lives by, um, in following God. And, um, yeah, so... I simply say, you know, that the only place to find the fullness of life, the best life, the, the life that God has for us, is is in Christ. And so, um, 
And now I just kind of want to exp expand on some of these kind of things that, um, why I say it's choose, choose sonship. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, in Christ we are, I've just written a few things down, accepted. We are accepted. We are loved and we are forgiven. And these are all things, as I mentioned, but these are all things the world says we have to earn. You know, if you kind of think a typical situation um, between two people, they fall out. People might say, I forgive you, but they're going to, in often, in, in reality, we're kind of saying, yeah, you earn that. You show me your, you, you show me your sorry. You show me you're not going to do that again. And then I'll show you the forgiveness. Um, you know, loved, um, I think the world, I think the media, um, you know, um, films, stories, novels, all the things, they talk about love. They talk about this journey, this search for love um, in these romantic kind of films and all the rest kind of that, that there's, there's this journey and one day you know there's, there's this love and you'll discover it and you have to earn it and you have to find this kind of prove it you have to prove your love you know a lot of the kind of Hollywood storylines the, the man has to prove that actually he loves the woman more than the, the business he's running or more than himself all those sorts of things and you know in Christ we're loved before we do anything before we even work God loved the thought of us um, he imagined us he, he destined us, he designed us. And, and you know, if, if you are here in this room, you need to know that you are desired by God. You were desired by God and he desired you into existence. So, yeah, uh, and, I, and what, I kind of, what, I'm, what I'm really seeing in, in, in the scripture and what I'm learning in my life is, is, is this thing about these two realities. And I've said, you know, earning or receiving. Um, and I, I'm just going to just going to go through a few of these things um, so looking at kind of the kingdom versus the world and I believe you know the kingdom the kingdom some of the things that we can look at our lives to see if we're living a life that's rooted in the kingdom or a life that's rooted in the world is um, you know love motivates in the kingdom if you're in the kingdom you're motivated by love there's something inside you that compels you to do the things that God's called you to do out of love and I think in the, in the world we're often driven out of law. I must do this. Oh, I need to do this. Someone's struggling. I need to. It's, it's this sort of, it's the right thing to do. Um, kind of that sort of attitude. Or I, I need to do it because I've been told to do it. Um, that sort of thing. And, you know, um, and in the kingdom, you know, we, we're living from this place of having this free gift of grace. I've kind of touched on a bit. And um, in the world, the world teaches us that we have to strive. The harder I strive, the more I earn. I'll, I'll be in this place of, of knowing I'm approved or knowing acceptance. And um, you know, the free gift of grace says you are approved because Jesus has, has done what needed to be done. Um, and you are accepted because, you, because Christ has taken your place. Um, I, look at, I look in the world and I say, you know, a lot of it, as I've said, you know, a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of the fruit from living in the world is is I think sometimes that we live in this place of performance, of putting on a front, of saying, oh yeah, I'm fine, everything's good. And I think the kingdom reality to that is actually we're living in a place of authenticity. We are who we are. You know, we, we are genuine. You know, if we're struggling, we say we're struggling. If we're hurting, we say we're hurting. Um, if we're happy, we say we're happy. happy. And, um, you know, there's... There's this, there's this realness, this authenticity, this genuineness with, um, with who we are. And, um, you know, we don't, we don't feel like we have to put on this front to protect ourselves anymore. Because we know we're secure. Our identity is in Jesus. So we're secure already. So we can be vulnerable. And, um, I, and I would, I'd say that, you know, the, 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 the kingdom life is a sustainable life. Um, it's a life where because you're living your whole life with God you're living each day with God drawing from where your roots are in Jesus everything he calls you to do is sustainable because it's, it's all done in obedience all done in response to his lead whereas if we're living from this place of how to earn if we're living in the world's reality do you know that the, 
promise you, eventually you'll burn up. You'll burn up, you'll burn out. You can look at this in churches, okay? So I was talking to, to Amy the other day about kind of what, what's the church? What church are we? What do we want to be like as a church? And um, it would be very easy if we had an unlimited supply of money, if we had the pick of any leaders, any gifted people, any gifts, whatever. You know, I think anyone in this room could, could, could build a very, very effective, dynamic church that grows, becomes a large church, has big influence, big impact. But I promise you, one day that will burn up. Because there's no such thing as an unlimited supply of money. There's no such thing as, you know, picking the cream of the crop with your team. Because people are people. You know, um, people are going to move on, all the rest of it. And um, you're not going to hold everyone together. And actually, the reality of that is, um, but that kind of church, if we built that kind of church, who would be coming to that church? I would, I would think 90% Christians would be migrating from other churches to that church. And um, I'm not trying to mock any churches here. I'm just saying, for us, what are we going to be? Um, And that kind of got, and we were talking, and I said, you know, because what, what you do in that sort of, in, if we were to establish that sort of church, what you do is you, you set up events, you publicise them really well, um, you get really marketing savvy, and all the rest of it, and, um, and people turn up to the events, they want to be there. We've seen this happen in the past. Something that so- sounds really exciting, you, do the, you get the right spin on it, people come. People come from all over, and they have a great time. But... Is it kingdom? Or is it having a nice time with a bunch of Christians? Um, you know, are we called to church to, to have these big, nice things? Or are we called to kingdom, living a whole life for Jesus? Um, I, I'd go, if, you know, if we're living in this place of being rooted in the kingdom, we expect the miraculous. We expect healing. That is our expectation. Whereas, I think if we're living kind of in this place, you know, in the world or, it, you know, in church that isn't kingdom-minded even, you know, when miracles come, they really surprise us. Oh, wow. You know, there's a story of when Paul was in prison and the church were gathering and they were praying for his release. And he comes and knocks on the door and they're like, what are you doing here? You know, they're praying for it. They're doing all the right thing, but there's no expectation. There's no kind of hope that, God will hear, and God will listen, and um, and there's no understanding even that you know that their words will affect the will of God, will will cause Him to step in and bring um, transformation to a situation. You know, in the kingdom we are called to the impossible. You know, if the call on our life seems too big. I can guarantee that God's the person that's put that in your heart. God's the person that's calling. If I can build it in my own strength, if I can do, if I can do it with the resources that I can gather, you know, if, if it's possible, it's probably not God. And I think in the kingdom, God calls us, calls, God calls us to dream big. Dream big, big dreams. And... What does the world tell us? More often than not, I believe the world tells us, be realistic. Can you really achieve that? Can you? Can you? Mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure you've got the right qualifications, or I'm not sure you've got the right personality, or the rest of it. The world looks to see, you know, are you qualified? Have you got what it takes? The kingdom says, I've got what it takes. Because Jesus has what it takes. And I'm one with him. So I just want to challenge us to just just to think, you know, you know for, for many of these, I can look down this list. There are there are many of these places where I am definitely rooted in the world, and um, and I'm going to be doing business with God on that over the next probably over the next few years. Let's be real. There's some areas where I'm probably more rooted in the kingdom, and I praise God for that. And um, I hopefully my, by the end of my life, the whole list will be here, <laughs> rooted in the kingdom. Um, but yeah, just just encourage you to reflect on that so again as I said at the beginning it's not for me to manufacture success or build my own platform if I'm not complete without it I'll never be complete with it there is nothing to prove I choose sonship 
Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labour in vain who build it. Do I want to build my own life? Do I want to build my own ministry? Do I want to build my own life? Based on my resources, my effectiveness? Or do I want to let God build it? Do I want to let God establish me? Do I want to let God, you know, take me wherever he wants to take me? We sing, we sing songs, you know, we sing um, the, the ocean song, you know, Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters, you know, wherever you will call me. It's a very easy song to sing. It's a lovely, it's a lovely melody. It's a lovely song. It's a, it's a really, I think it's a really feel-good song. There's a lot of the presence of God in it and it draws us in. But do we think about what that means? Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders. You know, where I don't know where I'm going, but I put my trust in you. Well, I don't see what's coming next, but I still trust you. Because I know you're holding my hand. In, in, even if I let go and I'm slipping on these waters, your hand is holding me firm and I'm not going to go down. You know, t- t- can we sing that? Can we sing that and, and mean that? You know, or actually, are we kind of like, yeah, I want that, but this is more comfortable. This is safer. This is a bit more known. Kind of, you know, I can look after my reputation here. Or I can, you know, I can, I can make sure and present the right image here, all that sort of stuff. Actually, it's what God thinks to me more important. And, uh, you know, a lot of this comes down to, you know, we, we can blame the world. And I've sort of said the world versus the kingdom, we can blame that, but, you know, it's Jesus versus self. Because if you look at the model of Jesus, Jesus models sacrifice, he models service, and he models salvation. Jesus left heaven, there's a sacrifice in that. He came, he left aside the riches of heaven and he came to earth to serve us to take upon himself all of our sin all of our shame all our iniquity he took it all upon himself out of love then he he took the consequence of all that as well so that we were saved so that we didn't have to face up to the to the mess that we've we've caused in our lives and um so that we're no longer lost, we're found in Him. So that we're no longer lonely. So that our lives are fulfilled. But if I don't, if I ignore that and I live my life for myself, and that's what all of this stuff in the world is really, it's choosing my way rather than God's way. If I'm living this place for myself, you know, that's consumerism really. You know, I want what I want. I want this big effective ministry or I want this nice big house and I want all this stuff and we accrue it and we accrue it and accrue it and that's what, you know, turn on the TV, watch the adverts, what's it saying? You need this, you need this. If you get this, your life will be more complete. If you if you have the latest gadget, you know, the world will look to you and, and, and go, oh, yeah, wow, you're sorted. All that sort of stuff. Or, or, or actually, let's, let's be real, we're probably all sitting at home going, oh, man, they think they're all that because they've got that or something like that. You know, because we're individuals. You know, the, 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 the self drives us to this place of individualism. It separates us. It's just the opposite of what God calls us to, which is unity. And it, it makes us live in this little bubble of our self. And uh, that may extend to, to a spouse or to a partner and to some children or an immediate family. But really, very, very centred around ourselves. And, and the reality, at the end of the day, if we're living in that place of being driven by consumerism, individualism, we sit down at the end of the day. I'd say most of us in that place, and I know I have been in that place, and, and at times can be, when I don't have my head in the right place, or my heart in the right place, I feel lost. I feel lonely, and I feel empty. You know, the, the latest gadget hasn't filled that hole in my heart. Even though I may have been out and had a great, what appears to be a great time of all my friends, I can still come home and sometimes feel lonely. Um, we, we live in this age of social media, don't we, where um, we, we control what the world sees about our lives. And um, in a way, that gives us the ability to kind of market ourselves. Um, you know, it gives us the ability to kind of say, this is who I am. This is who I think I am. And, and there's, there's lots of funny things out there about that, you know. Um, who do I think I am, you know picture of me with a skateboard in my profile picture all the rest of it I think I'm escaped all that sort of stuff and in reality you know 
when I used to skate, red says I could barely do anything. I could do one or two tricks, and that was it. But I, you know, I was a skater. You know, that's who I thought I was, and and all the rest of it. Um, you know, and the stuff doesn't fulfil. But the the danger of this sort of the social media, when it could be used for such good, and is so often used for good, is that we put this veneer up. We it, we go back to this thing I was talking about about um, where you know we we don't have this uh, this authenticity. We put the front on. We have this um, this performance, or this this is who I think I am, kind of thing going on. Um, and it's all, I think, really often to just cover up the loneliness and the emptiness in life. But there's good news because we are called to this life with Jesus, where we we live out of His sacrifice, and um, and and we learn to share in what He's done in serving the world. And and we know actually. We're not alone. We're not lost. We're completely found and one with him. And we talked about hope this morning. Um, actually, I was thinking about um, the word Helen gave it, about hope and, um, you know, pitch in a tent. And um, hope is a person. Hope is Jesus. Now, hope has a name. I mean, it's Jesus Christ. And, and that he is our hope. Um, and that's great news. <laughs> Um, and I just kind of want to say, like this this thing that I kind of was reflecting on um, as we do it, and talking, looking at the life of Jesus, and looking at kind of individualism, himself, lots of stuff. And just this thing gave me great hope in, you know, this thought, this that the church is the only society that actually exists for the benefit of its non-members. If you think about that for a minute, the church is the only society that exists for the benefit of its non-members, and that's incredible, actually. You think about that. Do we exist for ourselves, or do we exist to further the kingdom, to bring people into this amazing relationship that we know with Jesus? And I just want to say like three things about this. I believe that this should challenge us. You know, we should be asking ourselves the question: challenge ourselves. Who are we serving? And this should inspire us. You know, if we're in a place, you know, who are we serving? We may be able to. We may be able to answer that. Or we might not be able to answer that. So there's good news because it can inspire us. Who can I serve? So just think about that. Who can I serve? Who can I love? Who can I share God's love with? And this should really encourage us. Because it says that we have an assignment. This shows that we have a call from God. You know, it shows that we're part of his family. We're part of his mission to the world. We have an assignment how encouraging is that? You know, I think often we can feel left out. We can feel like, oh, these these people. So you know, we can look at people. Example: we look at Ian going off to Uganda and preaching and and, and praying for people. And, and you know, I met with him on Saturday morning, and um, some of the some of the, the words he he's, he's had for people, and 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 hearing the impact that those words have had in his travelling ministry. You know, that they're incredible. And and you could very easily look at something like that and go, oh, that's great for them. But what about me? And um, I'm glad Celia shared things about the walls this morning. But, you know, there may be big stones and there may be little stones. But even if you're a little tiny stone in that wall, you're called. You have an assignment. You can love someone. You can serve someone. And together, this wall can grow. And um, God God talks about how he builds us as as living stones into a holy temple. Um, So I just want to encourage us. Um, And... And if in those questions, you know, who are we serving or who can I serve, um, we, we kind of, we may kind of go, oh, I don't know. That's okay. The answer is we, we, we need to just ask God, where are you working? What, what are you doing? And how can I join in? And, uh, and that's what I mean about sonship and, and, and how this is about intimacy. It might sound like it's not, it might sound more like it's kingdom versus the culture of heaven versus the culture of earth, or whatever. But um, what I'm trying to get at is that this this stuff is is all in Him. It's all relational. So when my roots are in the kingdom, when I'm connecting and focusing on being His son, when that's my focus, forgetting all other things, what will come out of me is love for others. What will come out of me is is, is kingdom. What will come out of me? You know, healing, miracles, uh, transformed lives. My life transformed. If my life changes, if God transform, gets a hold of my life and transforms it, 
it will affect my family and it will affect everyone I know. That's just how it works. Um, and focusing on the roots is basically saying, God, I look to you. I look to you. Look at me. Look at me. See my life. Come and see anything in my life that you want to deal with and you have permission. You have permission to deal with that. You have permission to... to God, you have permission to completely take my foundation away. Anything I hold sacred, anything you know that I've built in myself, you can take it away. Because all that matters is that I'm found in you. And I trust you for everything. And that's kind of a scary place to be at times. And, and that's why, you know, it's a great place to be, but it's a scary place to be. And you know what, I kind of look at it as, you know, we are, as Christians, we are called to greatness. But it's a greatness that looks like boldness. It's a greatness that looks like fearlessness. You know, we, we know that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know, we are called to be lions. We are called to be like him in a tribe of lions. We are his lions. Fearless. One of the words that we've had recently, um, I have not sent you out onto the battlefield naked and unprepared. It goes on, you know, because we have his armour, because we have everything he has for us, we need not be afraid. We can stand firm and know that the enemy can't advance on us because God's prepared us. The enemy would be completely foolish to come and attack God's, God's tribe, God's people. But if we don't know who we are, if we don't know where our roots are, how can we be bold? How can we be fearless? So as we focus on him, as we focus on identity, as we focus on our rootedness, we start to hear about who God says we are. So it's amazing. As you look at God and see who he is, the reality is he will flip that back and say, and this is who I see you as. I see you as a son. I see you as a daughter. I see you as co-heirs with Christ. I see you one with Jesus. I see you right here in the midst of the Trinity. Right here in my arms, in my embrace, safe. And you know, the reality is, you know, if I am rooted in Christ, if I am surrounded by the Father's love in His arms, in His fully in His embrace, I can't be afraid of anything. Like the God who made all that we know, all that we see, all that we don't know, <laughs> made the universe with with a word called us into being, with one breath breathed dust into into who we are, uh, breathed breathed into the dust and made us um, and gave us life you know if he's holding me I'm not scared of anything I'm not intimidated by anything and I need not be because I know who he says I am and I have this inner confidence we find this inner confidence in, within us you know that God is there God is with me as I kind of mentioned when um, I was praying for Andy, you know, Jonathan with his, with his um, armour bearer, going up against the Philistine camp, just the two of them. If God is with us, we'll have victory. And they had victory. You know, if God is with us, we could do anything. And it's that place of root to this, that place of, of knowing God, is our ears start to hear what he's saying. So we start to respond to that. So if God says, I want you to just get out of your chair in Costa and go and talk to that person over there and tell them I love, I love them. God said it. What's there to fear? If he said it, he's going to do something with it. If the person doesn't respond, that's not us. Is it? That's not our problem, is it? Um, Romans 8.15 says, The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. So the spirit we receive is not one of uh, it is not one that we're slaves that we live in, it's not that we live in fear it's adoption to sonship you know we, we aren't given a spirit that is that is to be fearful that is to be timid anymore <coughs> why because we have this intimacy with God that you know intimacy um, I'm starting to look at it, is the golden rule of the kingdom it's the key to Christian life the more I open up my life to God the more I know him. The more I know him, the more I know who I am. So, my greatest struggle when I left home 
And throughout my early 20s, you know, it's the question a lot of us ask, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do with my life? You know, I did really well at school and um, I had a lot going for me and I could have done most things um, at university and things like that. And um, I'm not saying that kind of to pat myself on the back, that was my reality. And um, I could have studied, I could have studied at Oxbridge, I could have done all sorts of things. And the choice was overwhelming. I didn't know what to do. Um, do I want to study theology and become a scholar? Do I want to become an architect and all that sort of stuff? What do I want to do? What do I want to do? And you know, I just had to make a choice, so I made a choice and I started out on a road. And uh, sometimes I'm still like, God, what, what am I going to do? But um, uh, you know, over the years, I've come to this realization that I was asking the wrong question. The question that I didn't need to ask is, you know, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do with my life? The question. I should be asking is, who am I? Who am I? Um, and that comes also from asking another question, who are you, Lord? Who are you? And um, who do you say I am? And when I know who God says I am, I'll know exactly what I'm meant to be doing with life. And I know myself. And I know, when we know ourselves, when we can be real with ourselves and say, this is who you are. This is who God made you to be. Do you know, everything God's called us to do in that place is within us to do. You know, so we can do the stuff that we want to do. We can do the stuff that we're called to do, all that sort of stuff, because we know God's put it in there. God's put it in there to, to be that, to be that, you know, evangelist, or to be that uh, doctor, or you know, consultant, or whatever. You know, God, God says, "This is who, I, who you are." So, go and do it. And that's 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 really what I'm getting at with intimacy. So, you know, I'm going to summarise that in my final points. Um, if you're taking notes, this is probably worth getting down, but it's just a few little phrases. Intimacy provides identity. Because we know we are gods. So intimacy provides identi- identity. Identity operates through obedience. If we are God's sons and daughters, out of love, we trust what he says and we do it. We trust God. Obedience confirms authority. So, (laughs) what I'm saying is, God gave the assignment. So, if God's given a consignment, it's got his stamp on it. He's given his royal decree that what he's called us to do, he'll be with us in it, and he'll make it happen. And authority releases power. We've got, we've got the royal decree. God's called us to something. We we'll go. Expect power. Because that authority has been given to us, the power will come. Because the power of God is, it is his, it's, it's where our nature is suddenly coming in line with his nature. And we're starting to see him working through us. And the reality is the power of God transforms lives and it transforms situations. And I hope you get what I'm saying is it's all based in identity which you can only find in intimacy you can only find your true identity by opening your life up to Jesus and saying I'm all yours because you said you're all mine Um, and that's really where I want to leave that Um, thanks and I've talked for quite a while but thank you for bearing with that and I've got a few responses Paul could you lead some worship okay Um, so I've, I've just got a few responses that I'm going to put out here. Um, and if you would like to come and receive prayer, or you can stay where you are, it doesn't matter, but if you if you want prayer, um, go for it. <laughs> um, and I'd love to pray with people. But these are the responses I've thought of. Um, I just thought, you know, if people want to know this intimacy with God in a greater way, to be more assured in his love then it would be really really good to um, to respond to that in some way and uh, the, other, the other thing I get is that I think for some of us there's this movement from performance to authenticity so I'm kind of this, this thing about earning things and trying to achieve things 
into a place of actually just receiving it. Um, being real with God and being real with his people. And then the, the, the final thing that um, I think actually all of us could respond to in some way is that we'd walk in boldness. Is that we would not be timid, that we would not be slaves to fear any longer. But that we would choose sonship, that we would choose to root ourselves in who Jesus says we are. As I said at the start, it's not for us to manufacture success or build our own platform. If we're not complete without it, we'll never be complete with it. There's nothing to prove, so let's choose sonship.